In the last months of the Second World War, many devout Nazis believed Hitler had a final ace up his sleeve. The media had played up German research into so-called wonder weapons for years, and even as things crumbled around them, people believed these secret weapons could still win them the war. It's true, Germany did have a few secret weapons programs, including plans for a nuclear device, but they were interrupted early on by a plucky gang of Norwegians and Danes. This is the story of the Scandinavians who fought to ensure the Third Reich would never get a nuclear bomb. In the 1930s, it seemed German scientists were making all the discoveries in nuclear physics. It was Austrian and German scientists who discovered nuclear fission in 1938, and the German experimental physicist Wilhelm Handler who first proposed the idea of using fission inside a machine to create large amounts of energy. Georg Jus was fascinated by the idea and formed a research group called the Uranium Club to investigate possible uses of nuclear fission early in 1939. Within a few months, Jus and Handler notified the Reich of the possible military applications their research had. The day World War II began, a second uranium club formed. It was organized by Kurt Diebner, the head of the Heiss nuclear energy project, and its first meeting was held on September 16th. The invitees represented the top physicists and nuclear chemists in Germany. The big brains included Hans Geiger, inventor of the Geiger counter, and Werner Heisenberg, who helped discover quantum mechanics. Heisenberg became the scientific leader and the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Physics was placed under military jurisdiction and put at his disposal. At this early stage, Heisenberg believed that, in principle, atomic bombs could be made, but he was unsure how long it would take. He reportedly didn't want to get Hitler's hopes up, saying, I didn't report it to the Führer until two weeks later, and very casually because I did not want the Führer to get so interested that he would order great efforts immediately to make the atomic bomb. Heisenberg knew, as did the other scientists, that they couldn't promise anything right away. If Hitler heard about a world-ending weapon in 1939, he would have given the Uranium Club unlimited resources, but an extremely limited time frame. Unsatisfactory results could have had deadly consequences. Nevertheless, the physicists got to work. Their main problem, which is no different for anyone wanting to acquire a nuclear weapon, was producing enough fissile material for an explosive chain reaction. Normal uranium that you can dig out of the ground, uranium-238, is too stable to make a bomb out of it. It requires too much energy to get a chain reaction going. But hidden deep inside that boring form of uranium is the good stuff, uranium-235, which is just waiting to explode. If you enrich uranium, which is to increase the ratio of 235 to 238, of boom to boring, you can get a fission reaction to happen. One of the products of this reaction is uranium-239, which decays into plutonium. The core of Fat Man, the nuke dropped on Nagasaki in 1945, was made of plutonium. It's some of the best stuff for making nuclear weapons. The German scientists had worked all this out theoretically, but they were hung up on the details. If they got the enrichment process wrong, they might waste some of their valuable uranium, which the Reich had in very short supply. They tried to moderate their first fission reactions with graphite, but due to impurities, couldn't make it work. The next best thing was heavy water, a rare molecule that can be made via electrolysis. In the 30s and 40s, Norsk Hydro in Telemark, Norway, was the world's only mass supplier of heavy water. French intelligence secretly took Norway's heavy water stocks to Scotland in 1940, but the plant could make more. When Germany occupied Norway in June 1940, getting the Norsk Hydro plant running was one of their top priorities. By mid-1942, British intelligence had worked out that Germany was stockpiling heavy water from the Norwegian plant to use in the German nuclear program. They had to be stopped, so a plan was put together. 
Special Operations Executive recruited plant worker turned resistance fighter Einar Schinneland, a Norwegian patriot who had escaped to England during the German invasion. He knew the area well and was to scope it out for an advance party of four more Norwegians. The operation was codenamed Grouse and the saboteurs were rigorously trained. In the Scottish Highlands, they learned to plant bombs, navigate by night and silently kill. Schinnerland was ready after just 10 days of training and parachuted into Telemark to make contact with the resistance. The other Norwegians followed on October 18th. They gathered intelligence on German defences which was used to train two units of Royal Engineer Saboteurs. The plan was for each unit to be loaded into a Horsa glider and towed to the drop point by a Halifax bomber. They would land the glider silently in the snow, then navigate to the plant and set up explosives. This part of the operation was codenamed Freshman. But Operation Freshman went awry. Ice formed on the wings of one of the Halifaxes mid-flight and the bombers started losing altitude. The glider had to be detached early and it crash landed in Filiestal 200 kilometers from the plant. Many of the engineers were badly wounded and could not go on with the operation. Turbulence forced the second Halifax to descend and it crashed into a mountain. The glider was detached just beforehand though and managed to land. Again, most of its occupants were badly injured. Within 24 hours, the Germans knew of the operation and had arrested all of the British soldiers. Every one of them was executed as per Hitler's infamous commando order. The Norwegians, however, were still at large. Keen to avoid another debacle, the British decided to let the Norwegians do the sabotaging instead. Six more special operators parachuted into Telemark in February 1943 and made contact with the original Operation Grouse crew. This time, they brought their explosives. The operation was called Gunnerside. The men infiltrated the plant in the dead of night by crossing a frozen river and scaling a rock face. Once inside, they ran into the elderly caretaker, a man named Johansson. He was a patriot and decided to help out. Charges were set underneath the heavy water tanks and a Thompson SMG was left behind to incriminate the British Special Forces, sparing the local Norwegians from Gestapo reprisals. By the time the charges blew, the saboteurs were safely hidden in the forest. 500 kilograms of purified heavy water was destroyed, making Operation Gunnerside a striking success. While they may not have had the opportunity to blow up a power plant, the Danes also helped prevent Germany from building a nuclear device. Copenhagen's leading nuclear scientist, Niels Bohr, was spirited away by the resistance. Bohr made foundational contributions to quantum theory and was well aware that the physics he investigated could be weaponized to make a bomb. Heisenberg discussed this possibility with him during a secret meeting in 1941, but Bohr was firmly against it. It's not entirely clear what transpired in that meeting, but it seems likely that Heisenberg wanted Bohr to take an active role in the nuclear program. This Bohr couldn't abide. On September 29th, 1943, the Danish resistance transported Bohr and his family to a ship which took them to Sweden. Rumors had spread that his family was Jewish and the Gestapo may have been out to arrest him. This experience gave Bohr a new perspective. He petitioned Sweden's king, Gustav V, to declare Sweden a safe haven for Jews fleeing Nazi persecution. Gustav agreed. 7,000 Jews, many of whom were scientists, began a mass exodus from Denmark. Their expertise would not benefit the Axis cause. Around the same time, scientists working for Heisenberg in the Uranium Club in Germany were shifted to other projects. Hitler had lost interest in a nuclear device, and Albert Speer, Reich Minister of Armaments and War Production, felt the resources devoted to the project could be better spent elsewhere. The Nazis never got their new, in part due to the efforts of a few brave Norwegians and Danes. But what if they had? If Hitler had become fixated on the idea back in 1939, the Uranium Club might have gotten the resources and expertise necessary to create a nuclear device before the Allies made one. What do you think he would have done with it? Drop it on Moscow? Threaten the Allies with annihilation? Turn Europe into a radioactive wasteland? Let us know all that and more in the comments section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.